Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we're going to be looking at Zaitora's right hand captain, Agnes the Dragon's Lash. Before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll, and to check out what will be upcoming next on future episodes. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the Commander and Playstyle. Agnes the Dragon's Lash is a 3-3 Vyashino Warrior with haste that costs 1, a hybrid black-red, a red, and a hybrid red-green with the following ability. Whenever a creature you control with haste attacks, create a tapped treasure token. Breaking down her core stats, Agnes is sporting a mid-size CMC, a below average stat block for her cost, but she does have haste to allow her to swing in as soon as she comes down, and an ability that grants us some delayed ramp whenever she or another one of our hasty creatures swings in. Going more in depth into this ability, it quite simply turns all our hasty creatures into sources of treasure generation, including Agnes herself. And while yes, the treasure tokens do come into play tapped, meaning we'll need to wait a full turn for them to be usable, this is still potentially a massive amount of ramp that her mere presence on the battlefield is able to generate, enabling us to use the treasure she initially creates to summon more hasty creatures that in turn create more treasures as they swing in, quickly spiraling more and more out of control so long as our hasty creatures keep swinging. So, thanks to her ability, Agnes is clearly a combat-focused treasure-generating machine, flooding us with mana so long as we have the hasty creatures on board to swing in with. This then of course begs the question on how to take maximum advantage of this ability. Agnes can certainly go in a more treasure-focused build, aiming to use the treasures themselves as the means to defeat our opponents as we create and use them, and while I can see that build style certainly being effective, in this particular build I decided to take her in a slightly different direction. And by different, I mean tearing the brakes off of it and going all in on a huge hasty evasive creature build to go full aggro on our opponents. We won't be wasting any time with fancy treasure manipulation shenanigans, instead focusing on using our treasure generation to summon more hasty evasive bodies onto the battlefield. The evasion being key here to ensure our creatures simply don't die on contact with our opponent's blockers, and enabling them to keep creating more and more treasures as they continue to crack in. Luckily for us, Jund has no shortage of dragons, phoenixes, and even the odd vampire or two that fit the bill perfectly, hitting both hard and fast while sailing over pesky blockers, with some of them even being potent mana sinks to get even more usage out of our treasure stockpiles, and really pile on the damage. And as deadly as they are out of the box, we'll make them even deadlier with potent offensive power boosts, empowering them to hit even harder and crash through creatures that would otherwise stall out our all-out offensive game plan. But while most of our focus will be on our fast flying and hard hitting creatures, we'll need to make sure we can summon them in the first place and dig through our deck to find even more of them. Which is why we'll be running the best aggressive ramp our colors have access to, as well as means to turn our spare treasures into card advantage so we can replenish our cards as quickly as we cast them. So let's see just what Zaitora's second in command is capable of. While the other family's captains are content hiding behind their armies of mooks, Agnes can always be found on the front lines right next to her Riveter brethren, breaking heads right alongside them. She always leads from the front, bellowing the green flame Zaitora bestowed upon her to torture enemies and remind them what family they had the misfortune to cross. And once she's done with our opponents, it will be back to business as usual, cracking skulls and counting coins. So now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC 1 slot, we have its two members with Dockside Chef and Ravenous Squirrel, both of which let us sack a creature or artifact to draw a card, the former being a 1-2 that costs 1 and a black to do this, while the latter's a 1-1 that costs 1, a black, and a green to do this, but also gains us a life and gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter whenever we sack a permanent, both dropping early and giving us ways to convert our spare treasures into card advantage, with the latter turning itself into a bigger and bigger threat the more treasures we sack. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we start off with the Treasure Focus Legends, Kalein Reclusive Painter, and Magda Brazen Outlaw. Kalein is a 1-2 that creates a treasure when she ETBs, and whenever another creature ETBs under our control, it comes into play with additional plus one plus one counters for each mana from a treasure spent to cast it, passively making all our hasty evasive creatures even deadlier as we crack our treasures to cast them. Magda is a 2-1 that gives all other dwarves plus 1 plus 0, creates a treasure token whenever a dwarf becomes tapped, and lets us sack 5 treasures to put an artifact or dragon card from our deck onto the battlefield, providing us with a direct way to cheat our top end dragons directly into play and even allowing us to use our tapped treasures to do so, all of which you can do on our opponent's turns to boot. Then we close out this slot with Sakura Tribe Elder, a 1-1 we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, serving as some solid low to the ground ramp and fixing to help us get Agnes out faster and begin our treasure generation. 
Now entering the CMC3 slot, we have our first wave of hasty flyers with Flamewake Phoenix, Lightning Phoenix, and Phoenix of Ash. All of which are 2-2 hasty flyers that can return themselves from our graveyard back to the battlefield under certain conditions. The first having to attack each combat if able and reanimating itself on our upkeep if we control a 4 plus power creature and pay a red. The second being unable to block and returning on our end step if 3 plus damage was dealt to an opponent that turn and we pay a red. And the third letting us pay 2 and a red to give it plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn and letting us escape it by paying 2, double red and exiling 3 other cards from our graveyard, returning it into play with a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Making them all relatively cheap and, most importantly, expendable bodies we can drop early, swing in for fast treasure, and, should they die, we can easily reanimate to keep the treasures flowing. Chaos Dragon then joins us as our last hasty flyer in this slot, being a 4-4 that must attack each combat if able and has each player roll a d20 on our combat phase, being unable to attack the player who rolled the highest, making it the biggest body in this slot, and, while its randomness can be annoying at times, it's still 4 damage to one of our opponents that creates a treasure alongside our commander, making it more than good enough to run. Then closing out this slot, we have some more treasure-focused card advantage sources with Professional Facebreaker and Skullport Merchant. Professional Facebreaker is a 2-3 with Menace that creates a treasure token whenever one or more creatures we control deal combat damage to a player, and lets us sack a treasure to exile a top card of our deck, letting us play that card until end of turn. Easily generating even more treasure for us as our evasive creatures crack in for damage, and then turning even our tapped treasures into free impulse draw to make sure we don't run out of gas so long as we keep generating coin. Skullport Merchant is a 1-4 that creates a treasure when it ETBs and lets us pay one, a black, and sack another creature or treasure to draw a card, providing us with yet another cheap means to consume our spare treasures to turn them into card advantage, and even allowing us to sack our creatures in response to removal and wipes to get extra value out of them before they perish. The CMC4 slot then brings us a more Phoenix entrance in the form of Akuma Firebird, Skyfire Phoenix, and Warcry Phoenix. Again, all being hasty flyers that can reanimate themselves conditionally. The first being a 3-3 that attacks each turn if able and reanimates if we play a land and pay 4 and double red. The second also being a 3-3 that reanimates whenever we cast our commander. And the third being a 2-2 that returns into play tapped and attacking whenever we attack with 3 plus creatures and pay 2 and a red. Giving us another wave of fast flying and dispensable bodies that we can throw at our opponent's faces to keep the treasure flowing, and we can easily bring right back into play when they're dealt with. And to make full use out of the phoenixes we're running, the legend Cyrix Carrier of the Flame will also be joining our ranks, being a 3-3 hasty flyer that, on our end step if a creature left our graveyard that turn, has target phoenix deal damage equal to its power to any target, and if another phoenix we control dies, lets us cast Cyrix from our graveyard. Working nicely alongside its brethren as another hasty flyer, that also brings some additional removal and burn to the table as our phoenixes resurrect themselves, while also being easily resurrectable itself as its brethren die in combat or we sack them away for value ourselves. Then moving away from Firebirds and onto Bloodsuckers, we have Falcon Wrath Aristocrat and Miri the Cursed, both of which have flying in haste, the former being a 4-1 that lets us sack a creature to give itself indestructible until end of turn, along with a plus one plus one counter if the sacked creature was human, and the latter also having first strike and gaining a plus one plus one counter whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, making them both fast formidable flyers, the former having solid defenses against removal and wipes, while the latter only gets bigger as our opponents try to chump block her. And wrapping up our evasive beat sticks in this slot, we have a pair of dragons joining us in the form of Territorial Hellkite and Skyship Stalker. Territorial Hellkite is a 6-5 hasty flyer that must attack an opponent at random each turn which it did not attack on the previous turn, otherwise tapping itself on our combat phase if it's unable to do so. Like Chaos Dragon before it, possessing a massive evasive body for its cost and, despite its random nature, being more than bulky enough to warrant running. Skyship Stalker is a 3-3 flyer that we can pay a red to grant any of the following abilities until end of turn. Plus 1 plus 0, First Strike, and or Haste. Fulfilling the requirement of being evasive with easy access to Haste, while also having easy access to First Strike and cheap Fire Breathing, allowing it to hit very hard if unblocked or tear blockers apart if intercepted, so long as we have the mana to pump into it. Then closing out this slot, we have Beast Whisperer, a 2-3 that draws us a card whenever we cast a creature spell, providing us with a way to turn our high creature count into repeatable cards advantage to ensure our hands remain full for every fast flyer we cast. Proceeding to the CMC5 slot, we have our last Phoenix joining us with Kuldrotha Phoenix, a 4-4 hasty flyer that can resurrect itself on our upkeep if we control 4 or more artifacts and pay 4, making it our biggest firebird while also being quite easy to reanimate thanks to our treasure generation. It's then back to dragons as we delve deeper into this slot with Glorybringer, Stormbreath Dragon, and Thundermaw Hellkite. Glorybringer is a 4-4 hasty flyer that we can exert as it attacks to deal 4 damage to target non-dragon and opponent's controls, serving as a fast flying body as well as an additional source of removal, provided we're willing to take off a turn swinging in with it to use it. 
Stormbreath Dragon is another 4-4 hasty flyer, this time with protection from white and monstrosity 3 for 5 and double red, dealing damage to each opponent equal to the number of cards they have in hand when it becomes monstrous. Its protection giving it even better evasion and defense against white's flying threats and removal, while its monstrosity can easily turn it into a 7-7 and deal substantial damage to the table, especially if timed with someone reloading their hand. Thunder Maw Hellkite is a 5-5 hasty flyer that, when it ETBs, deals 1 damage to each creature with flying our opponent's control and taps them, making it an ideal way to open up the skies if they're clogged up with flying tokens or bodies so that our creatures can safely crash in for damage and generate treasure. Then some more conditionally hasty dragons join our ranks with Skargan Hellkite and Kalagan the Storm's Fury. Skargan Hellkite is a 4-4 dragon with Riot that, if it has a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, lets us pay 3 in a red to have it deal 2 damage divided between up to 2 targets, allowing us to either have it come in as a 4-4 hasty flyer or a 5-5 that we can pump mana into to use as removal or burn, either of which can be good depending on the situation. Call again is a 4-5 flyer with dash for 3 a black and a red that, whenever a dragon we control attacks, gives all creatures we control plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. Her dash allowing us to use her more like a sorcery speed super battle cry to massively power up our entire board alongside our 14 other dragons, and even gaining haste when dashed out to get us that extra treasure while doing so. Then we close out this slot with Cavalier of Flame, a 6-5 that, when it ETBs, lets us discard any number of cards from our hand and then draw that many. When it dies, deals damage equal to the number of lands we have in our graveyard to each opponent and planeswalker they control, and lets us pay 1 in a red to give all our creatures plus 1 plus 1 in haste until the end of the turn. Doing quite a bit for us by letting us pitch our dead cards and phoenixes to dig further into our deck, massively powering up our entire board with its AoE fire breathing, and sporting a huge body with On Death Burn to still get decent damage in despite not being evasive. The CMC 6 slot is then up next, with even more dragons joining our army in the form of Rorix Bladewing, Hellkite Charger, and Inferno of the Star Mounts. Rorix is a 6-5 hasty flyer with no other abilities, effectively serving as an on-curve beatstick that synergizes with our game plan, which is enough to earn him a spot on this list. Hellkite Charger is a 5-5 hasty flyer that, when it attacks, lets us pay 5 and double red to untap all our creatures and get an additional combat phase, giving us another fast evasive beatstick that's also a mana sink for additional combat phases, making it an incredibly dangerous threat that turbocharges our aggro playstyle the longer it sticks around. Inferno is a 6-6 hasty flyer that we can pay a red to give plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and, if we increase its power to 20 this way, deals 20 damage to any target, giving us another well-statted fast evasive body, along with a fire breathing effect effect that not only lets him hit incredibly hard, but also blasts someone in the face for 20 if we're able to stockpile enough treasures to get there. Then we close out this slot with Emissary of Grudges, a 6-5 hasty flyer that, when it ETBs, has us choose an opponent in secret, letting us reveal our choice once per game whenever that player targets us or a permanent we control with a spell or ability with a single target, then allowing us to change that target, giving us yet another offensive beat stick that comes in with some mana-less protection for ourselves and our other creatures as a bonus. Closing in on the end now, the CMC7 slot brings us another trio of dragons with Hellkite Igniter, Tyrant's Familiar, and Diragaz Reincarnated. Hellkite Igniter is a 5-5 hasty flyer that we can pay 1 in a red to give plus X plus 0 until end of turn, where X is equal to the number of artifacts we control, enabling us to boost its power to insane levels even with a moderate treasure hoard to allow it to tear into our opponent's life totals with ruthless efficiency. Tyrant's Familiar is another 5-5 hasty flyer that, if we control our commander, gains plus 2 plus 2 and deals 7 damage to target creature the defending player controls whenever it attacks, easily turning into a 7-7 with on attack removal so long as our commander's on board, which should be most of the time as usually our opponents will have more pressing creatures to worry about. Creatures like Diragaz, a 7-7 hasty flying trampler that, when he dies, is exiled instead with 3 egg counters on him, removing an egg counter from himself on each of our upkeeps and returning into play once the last one is removed, making him our biggest, hardest hitting dragon so far with a built-in form of defense that, while slow, is very reliable and makes it hard to get rid of him for too long. And finally, reaching the CMC 8 slot, we have our last creature entrant with Hellkite Overlord, an 8-8 hasty flying trampler that lets us pay a red to give it plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, or a black and green to regenerate it, making it an enormous evasive threat that can swing in as soon as it comes down, that we can pump its damage and even has cheap and repeatable defense against removal, making it one of, if not the most powerful and resilient threats we have in our arsenal and well worth its mana cost. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Skipping to the CMC2 slot, we begin with Reckoner's Bargain and Costly Plunder, both of which let us sack a creature or artifact to draw two, the former also gaining us life equal to the sacked permanent CMC, both giving us easy instant speed access to turn our treasures into card advantage, and even our creatures in response to removal and wipes if needed. 
Some removal options are then up next with Terminate and Infernal Grasp, both of which destroy target creature, the former preventing it from regenerating and the latter costing us 2 life to use it, making them superb dirt cheap removal options to deal with any problematic creatures we may come across. Wilt then joins us as another removal option, which destroys target artifact or enchantment and has cycle for 2, serving a solid back or removal or a cantrip instead if we'd rather have the draw. Then we close out this slot with Magma Quake, an X spell that deals X damage to each creature without flying and Planeswalker, making it a scalable instant speed wipe that dodges our flyers entirely while leveling our opponent's creature base along with their walkers as a bonus. Continuing on to the CMC3 slot, we have even more removal options joining us with Beast Within and Chaos Warp. The former destroying target permanent and giving its owner a 3-3 to replace it, while the latter shuffles target permanent back into its owner's deck, and then has them reveal the top card from it, allowing them to put it into play if it's a permanent. Both allowing us to deal with almost any type of permanent threat at instant speed, making their flexibility well worth their downsides. Bedevil and Putrefy then join us as even more removal, the former destroying target artifact creature or planeswalker, while the latter only hits artifacts and creatures but prevents them from regenerating, making them not quite as flexible as the previous pair but still hitting a wide variety of threats to make them well worth running. Then we close out this slot and our instance with Cloth's Will, an X spell that either deals X damage to each creature without flying, or instead destroys up to X target artifacts or enchantments, doing both if we control our commander, making it quite a powerful wipe that largely ignores our creature base while leveling our opponents as well as picking apart their back row, all of which occurs at instant speed to make it even better. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Skipping again to the CMC2 slot, we start off with the Ramp Sources, Rampant Growth, and Farseek, both of which let us put a land from our deck into play tapped, the former being limited to basics, and the latter to any kind of land with a non-forest basic land type, making them cheap ramp and fixing to help us get to Agnes faster and kickstart our game plan. Then continuing on to the CMC3 slot, we have even more ramp with Cultivate and Kodama's Reach, both of which search our deck for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into our hand, giving us even more access to ramp and fixing to help smooth out and speed up our mana base. Painful Truths and Read the Bones then join us as some card advantage sources in this slot, the former having us draw X and lose X life, where X is the number of different colors of mana we spent to cast it, and the latter having us scry 2, draw 2, and lose 2 life, making them both reliable sources of card advantage that don't rely on our boards to reload our hands. And then ending this slot in category, we have Lava Lanch, an X spell that deals X damage to target player or planeswalker, and every creature that player or planeswalker's controller controls making it a scalable single-player wipe that can tack on a substantial amount of burn or removal for a troublesome planeswalker while reducing that player's board to cinders. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. It's single entrance all the way down in this category, starting off in the CMC1 slot with Font of Fertility, which lets us pay one a green and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, giving us yet another source of dirt cheap ramp to help speed up our mana base. The CMC2 slot then brings us Goblin Aura Flame, which gives all attacking creatures we control plus one plus zero, providing us with a cheap means to give all our creatures an offensive power boost to help them shred our opponent's life totals even faster. Similarly, the CMC3 slot brings us Ferocity of the Wilds, which gives all attacking non-human creatures we control plus one plus zero as well as Trample, giving us another offensive battle cry effect to pump up all our creatures as they swing in, and its AoE Trample being relevant in case we run into swarms of flying blockers that would otherwise stall out our offensive game plan. Then skipping straight to the CMC5 slot and our last enchantment, we have Glorious Sunrise, which, at the beginning of combat on our turn, lets us choose one of the following effects. All creatures we control gain plus one plus one in trample until end of turn. Target land can tap for triple green until end of turn. Draw a card if we control a three plus power creature, or gain three life. Doing a bit of everything for us with its on attack AoE stat boost and trample, ramp, draw and life gain, all of which can be useful and we can switch between depending on what the situation calls for. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. It's mostly going to be mana sources in this category, with Wayfarer's Bauble and Soul Ring starting us off in the CMC1 slot, the former letting us pay 2, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, and the latter tapping for 2 colorless, both speeding up our mana base considerably to help us get to our commander and other hasty creatures even faster. Continuing on the ramp trend, the CMC2 slot brings us Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Gruel Signet, which we can pay 1 and tap to generate a red and green, and Rakdo Signet, which we can pay 1 and tap to generate a black and red, all serving as even more cheap ramp sources to speed up our mana base even further. 
And finally, reaching the CMC3 slot, we have our final artifact with Lifecrafter's Bestiary, which lets us scry one on our upkeep and pay a green whenever we cast a creature spell to draw a card, working nicely alongside our large creature base as a source of repeatable card advantage. That covers all our artifacts, and with no Planeswalkers to cover, let's move straight to our land base. Starting with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, Savage Lands, which comes into play tapped and taps for any of our colors, Cinder Glade and Smoldering Marsh, both of which come into play tapped unless we control two or more basic lands, tap for two of our colors and have the basic land types of the mana they would be able to produce, Forboding Ruins and Game Trail, both of which come into play tapped unless we reveal a land of the basic land type of the mana they would be able to produce and tap for two of our colors. Rockfall Veil, which comes into play tapped unless we control two or more other lands and taps for a red or green. Mossfire Valley, which we can pay one and tap to generate a red and green. Blighted Woodland and Myriad Landscape, both of which tap for a colorless and we can tap and sack to put two basic lands from our deck into play tapped. The former costing three and a green to do this, while the latter only costs two but comes into play tapped and is limited to fetching two of the same basic land. And finally, Riveter's Outlook, Evolving Wilds, and Terramorphic Expanse, all of which we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, the first doing so as soon as it ETBs and also gaining us a life, while the latter two allow us to tap them to do so. Then for our utility lands, we'll be running Bajuga Bog, Bonder's Enclave, and Castle and Breath. Bajuga Bog comes into play tapped, taps for a black, and exiles target player's graveyard when it ETBs, giving us a solid source of graveyard hate from our land slot. Bonder's Enclave taps for a colorless, and we can pay 3 and tap it to draw a card if we control a creature with 3 plus power, taking advantage of our decent number of high power creatures to keep our hands nice and full throughout the course of the game. Castle Embreath comes into play tapped unless we control a mountain, taps for a red, and we can pay one double red and tap it to give all our creatures plus one plus zero until end of turn, providing us with yet another way to give all our creatures an offensive edge as they crack in. And finally, we're running five swamps, seven mountains, and seven forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 36 creatures including the commander, 11 instants, 7 sorceries, 4 enchantments, 6 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 28 creatures with haste or the ability to give themselves haste, 26 of those creatures who have flying, 5 sources of offensive stat boosts for our creatures, and 6 cards that are able to use our treasures to generate additional value leaving us with a stacked assortment of hasty evasive bodies to consistently pump out treasures alongside our commander, ways to pump them even further to make them deadlier as they swing in, and means to turn our excess treasures into additional card advantage to keep adding more fuel to our all-out blitz play style. For general deck stats, we have 17 ramp sources, 12 card draw sources, 13 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes. Our ramp being slightly higher than normal due to our need to get our commander and bigger hasty creatures out as quickly as possible, while our other core stats fall within more normal numbers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 5 1 drops, 15 2 drops, 18 3 drops, 10 4 drops, 8 5 drops, 4 6 drops, 3 7 drops, and 1 8 drop, giving us a more aggressive curve loaded with fast ramp to get Agnes out quickly, aiming to turn on our treasure production and then allowing us to get even more ramp as we play and swing in with more hasty evasive creatures, fueling our own game plan so long as we keep attacking. Currently, this deck is valued at $65.31, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, if we want to focus getting more out of creating and using up our treasures, Disciple of the Vault, Reckless Fireweaver, and Marionette Master all add some solid burn to the build as we generate and use them up, as does Mayhem Devil to add some spot removal to that burn as well. Otherwise, Vengeful Reaper can be considered as another low-cost flyer that we can foretell out cheaply. Uvenvald Oddity may not be evasive, but is still a hasty trampler that eventually transforms into an 8-8 that makes our entire board bigger as well as granting them AoE trample. Zorn gives us an easy way to double up on all our treasure generation to ramp us even harder. And Karthus Tyrant of Jund is another enormous hasty flying trampler to help strengthen our endgame. For upgrades, Deadly Dispute is another way to turn our treasures into card advantage that even creates another treasure when we use it. Cloth Unrivaled Ancient gives us a huge amount of ramp that fits with our aggro-focused game plan while contributing to it as a hasty flyer. Grim Hireling gives us even more treasure generation as our creatures crack in and lets us turn those treasures into removal. Scytherix the Blight Dragon can be considered if we want to run a hasty evasive and resilient source of infect to piss off the rest of the table. And Goldspan Dragon makes for a perfect addition as both a hasty flyer, a source of treasure, and a way to make all our treasures doubly as effective. 
And finally, from the upcoming Commander Legends 2 set, Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes may warrant consideration since they come in with effectively a 4-4 hasty trampling body to protect themselves or crack in, can permanently grow our hasty creatures to make them even deadlier, or alternatively letting us sack them for removal or burn, and even drawing us cards. Though we may want to wait for the price to come down before we buy these icons, though they are worth every penny on the Baldur's Gate nostalgia alone. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Again, I'd like to take a moment to thank all the channel subs for helping the channel crack the 4.2k milestone. Thanks again for helping the channel grow, as we would have not gotten to this point without all of your support. Taking a look at the results of last week's poll, after a brutal back and forth on our biggest poll to date, it looks like Zyatora was able to edge out Rafine for the top spot. So look forward to a sack heavy treasure focus build featuring her next week. Then moving on to next week's poll, we'll actually be putting that on hold for now, since the spoilers for the precons for Commander Legends Battle for Baldur's Gate will be dropping next week and we'll need to start working on those precon upgrades ASAP. However, since Streets of Nuka Penna only got a few builds outside of the precon upgrades, I'd like to hear from you. Once the precons have been covered, do you folks want to see future polls have a mix of both entrants from Streets of Nuka Penna and Battle for Baldur's Gate, or instead just focus on Battle for Baldur's Gate entirely? Be sure to cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, to let me know which setup you'd rather see, as well as what commanders and backgrounds you're most excited about from Battle for Baldur's Gate so we can start setting up those poll options as well. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Sahir21 again for another generous donation. Thanks for another coffee, Sahir21, and thanks for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to check out the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.